So uh, there's a QR code link here if you would like to download the audio files that we're going to be using uh, in this demonstration of using geometry nodes and simulation nodes for audio reactive music videos. Um, I'll leave that up for, for just a second. Um, hopefully the link will work. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Mike Hodgetts. I'm the head of CG for a company called Simplates.com. Uh, we provide um, 360 videos, there we go, making sure it works. Uh, we provide 360 panoramas uh, that are totally seamless and looping, uh, that are CG driving plates for the virtual production industry, specifically for car processing. Uh, all of these are done in Blender and rendered in Octane. Um, I appreciate it's not the subject of this talk at all, uh, but it would be remiss of me not to plug our own work. Um, if anybody is interested here in using Octane for Blender or works in the virtual production space, specifically within car processing, please do come and speak to me afterwards, either here or in the bar later on. I would love to have a chat with you about it. Uh, I would also just like to give a quick shout out to the Render Network Foundation and Otoy. Um, without these guys, the work that we do at Simplates would not be possible. Uh, they've pretty much pushed our pipeline forward about 12 months uh, because of the amazing work they do. I believe they've got a booth in the marketplace on Friday. Uh, so if you get the chance, please do and go and check them out. I think they're, they're really great. Um, in addition to this, I'm also a freelance 3D artist. I've been using Blender for almost 20 years. I'd like to think I've come, you know, some way uh, since making some very terrible, uh, weird sci-fi thing there on the left. Um, in addition to doing things like um, sci-fi models in my free time, I also work with, I do architectural visualization projects for housing developers. And more recently, I've been working with musicians, uh, most notably and recently Sabrina Carpenter. Uh, I can't talk about that work, unfortunately, because it's under NDA. Um, but also uh, Jacob Collier, which brings me to the subject of today's talk. Um, quick show of hands, actually. How many people are aware of Jacob Collier and, and know who he is or are fans? OK, cool. A few of you. Um, for those of you that aren't aware of him, he's a British multi-Grammy award-winning musician. Um, his style is very avant-garde, should we say. It's a bit kind of uh, crazy. And his latest album, uh, Jesse Volume 4, was released back in March. Um, you can see the album art there on the left. The cool thing about that album art is that it's actually a photo of a real uh, piece of art. Uh, made by uh, the New York artist Dustin Yellen. He's got a very unique style where he takes thousands and thousands of images um, and layers them on like planes of glass, either by painting them or printing them um, to create these kind of crazy collages. You can see here is another example of uh, Dustin's work. Um, it was a really, it was a real trip to be able to work with them. Um, what they wanted from us for the Jacob Collier project was, in addition to the, um, like the music videos that were being released with the album, they wanted us to digitize that artwork and then to create kind of audio reactive um, videos. So what I ended up having to do was manually, with the knife tool, cutting out over 3,000 images. That was a long two weeks of my life. Um, there was a lot of podcasts to listen to during that and yeah, just compiling all of these things. Um, I've got a little bit of a demo here of like a medley of stuff from the album uh, that I can play for you to show you the kind of work that we did. I'm just hoping that the audio levels are gonna be okay. To cover me, peace, a remedy, and again and again and again. Trees to cover me, peace, a remedy.
I just want your body, baby And every night I feel so tired But I can't sleep But I just might be, so now feel free Tell me what's next, does it go right? If I turn left, if I'm gonna take a flight Can we cop a little jet? There's so much I wanna see And so much I'm gonna get Gotta keep my stride with the pepped up step I'ma be just fine, you can make that bet Everything's on time, cause it's all concept Live a carefree life, ain't got one regret so yeah, there's a little selection there of uh, the work. Thank you. The, uh, the full videos are available on Jacob's uh, YouTube channel. Um, and so what I'd like to do today is to create an audio visualizer completely from scratch, uh, utilizing a number of the concepts that I've demonstrated there. I've actually got... There we go. I've got this video um, that I put together as a demonstration ahead of, of this conference. Uh, the music for this was put together and arranged and mixed and recorded by a very good friend of mine, Greg Roberts, who specifically recorded this audio specifically for Blender Conference. Um, so I'm just going to play this and this is what we're going to be creating live in a moment. If it will play. That's what we're going to start creating live. Thank you. Well, hopefully by the end of this, you'll all know how to make that and you can give yourselves a round of applause. So I'm going to jump over to Blender. I've got a brand new scene. I'm uh, using 4.2. And I'm actually not going to delete the default cube. I'm just going to delete the light, though. Um, I'm going to go into front view, uh, control, alt, zero. Ah, oh, of course it's not doing that. Hang on. Yeah, <laughs> the HDMI seems to be not, there we go, okay, start new file, okay, so new file, there we go, I'm not going to delete the default cube, I am going to delete the light though, <laughs> um, I'm just going to control alt zero to create my camera view uh, in front view, and the default cube is what we're going to use as the, the canvas for creating our uh, visualizer. You could use whatever shape you wanted. You could use a sphere. You could use a Suzanne head. You could do it whatever you wanted. Um, I'm going to go into edit mode, though, and scale this up twice on the x-axis just to give me a bit more uh, room to work with. Let's go over to geometry nodes, uh, add new geometry node setup, and this is where we're going to start building things out. Let's turn off my overlays and my widgets and my toolbar. So what we're going to do is start by turning this mesh into a volume. So we're going to go mesh to volume. And then we're going to distribute some points inside that volume. We're not going to work with instances here. I'm just going to render these directly as points. Um, but of course, you could you know, do an instance on points node later on and put instances onto them, which is how we did things like the Jacob Collier work. Um, I'm not going to leave this as random. I'm actually going to go with a grid layout. I think it's just going to look a little better. And for our spacing, this is where we can start creating the density of our uh, visualizer. So what I'm actually going to do is use a switch so that I can basically have like a preview and a render density. And if I use the is viewport node, I've basically now got a switch where the true value is going to be my um, density in my viewport and the false is going to be the density in render. So I'm going to go with 0.01 and 0 0.05 for the render for the moment. We could parameterize these. We might need to change them later. Um, I'm also going to do the same thing for the point radius. So I can duplicate these. 
hook this up to our radius and I'm going to go with a viewport density of 0 0.01, 0 0.02 and a false, so a render value of 0 0.01. So now we've got our points started. I'm going to control J, add these into a frame. Uh, we'll call it points. I'm just gonna try and keep things nice and organized. Um, whenever I'm creating geometry nodes, networks, I get a little bit um, kind of OCD about my geometry nodes layouts and like having things nice and organized and framed up. So the way that we're going to um, start building this out is by building layers of noise that we will then animate uh, with our audio values. So I'm going to start by just building those layers of noise up and then we'll bring in our audio afterwards. So to start, I'm going to use a set position node. I'm going to add a noise texture. And whenever we're using a noise texture to change the position of points, we always need to subtract 0.5 from the vector. Uh, this will center our vector around the zero point, it means that they don't get offset and wonky. I'm going to plug this into our offset. Immediately, it all looks a little bit crazy. We're going to set this to 4D so that we have a W value to change our noise. Scale needs to be way smaller. I'm actually going to change this, I think, from FBM to, mm, we'll go ridge multifractal to start with. Reoffset this. And we're going to need to make the scale a lot smaller. So 0 0.01, and then we can increase the distortion uh, quite a lot to, say, 100. So now, in fact, let's go with hybrid multifactor instead. There we go. That looks a bit better. So now we've got a W factor that where we could, as we move this, up our noise is going to distort and that's going to be the first layer of noise we can frame these up and this is going to be our noise for our main riff uh, like the main guitar riff of the uh, music i'm going to do another one so set position i'm going to add another noise texture and instead of just uh, subtracting it so we will do that but what I'm also going to do is multiply this by the position of our points. So this is just going to give us a little bit of an added level of complexity. So we can multiply these together. And then if we use this as a scale value, we may need to change the scale on this. Hook this up to the offset. And this one will go with a heteroterrain. Again, this, the scale is going to need to be a lot smaller, 0 0.01. Going to zero these off and increase our distortion. Set it to 4D, so again, we've got a, a W value that we can change here. So now we've got two separate W values that we can change. And in fact, I probably need to scale that a bit further down lower the strength on it to 0 0.5. We frame these ones up. These are going to be the noise for our lead guitar. So this is going to be our, the, the main kind of solo parts that we heard during the, um, during the demo. And then finally, we want a third layer of noise, which is going to be our drum beat. And this is going to form that kind of pulsing motion where every time that the drum beat hits, it pulses outwards. So once again, we are going to set position. I'm going to add a noise texture. And in fact, actually, what I'm going to do is just duplicate this whole setup from the noise lead. And we can rename this to noise drum. Hook these up. And now this scale value here Right, let's change this one to, let's change this again. So we had a hybrid multifractal, a heteroterrain, and we'll go with a ridged multifractal for this one. So now as we scale this in the negative direction, we're kind of pulsing this outwards. 
And again, we've got a seed value that we can change here. Set these back to zero, so that when we add our drums in, it's going to push the scale in the negative direction. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, before we start adding our audio, let's set up some materials and the colors for our visualizer. So I'm going to add a set material node. I'll split my window. And get a shader editor, add a new material, and I'm just going to call it emission. We can get rid of our principal BSDF because we don't need it. We're just going to use an emission shader. Hook that up. And instead of controlling the color and the strength inside our shaders, I want to use attributes from geometry nodes that I can then deal with the color and the strength procedurally inside the geometry nodes network. So let's just turn the strength on our world down to zero. You can come into EV. Make sure we're using our scene world. We can set the material in our geometry nodes. Um, I'm also actually, before I set up those attributes, I'm going to just go to the compositor, use nodes, and I'm going to add a glare node, just so we're going to get a little bit of bloom. Set these to 0 0.75. Um, with a size of I don't know, five, maybe. Make sure we enable our compositor in our viewport shading. Five is way too strong. Yeah, four, that'll do. Let's go back to our shader. And as I said, instead of controlling the color and the strength from our shader editor, we're gonna use attributes inside our geometry nodes. So all I'm gonna do is add an attribute node We'll call this first one color, and we can duplicate it, and we'll call this one strength. Hook these up, and of course, everything goes black because these do not currently exist as attributes. That's well, okay, we can now create those. So, store named attribute, let's get two of them. First one is going to be called color, and it's going to be a color on the point domain. And then the next one will be strength, which turns out I can't spell. There we go. So now we can control our color and our strength directly inside of geometry nodes. <clears throat> For our color, um, I want these to have that kind of, um, kind of rainbow effect where it's going through all the colors of the color spectrum. So I'm gonna use a color ramp. And the way that I'm going to set this up is by using the noise factor right at the beginning from our riff. So if I store an attribute here, we'll call this noise, and we'll hook up the factor to here. We can then use this attribute later on for our materials. So we're going to get a named attribute, get our noise. And by hooking this into the color ramp and then the color into the color, we now have colors that are going to work depending on our noise. So as I change the W value of our noise, those colors are going to follow along with it. Don't just want to set it as these kind of blue and greens though. I want a kind of a rainbow effect. And there's a really easy way to do that with the color ramp. Um, if you just change it, the color mode to HSV and change it to far. And what we can do is that will literally go around the entire color wheel. So I can set the first flag to a hue of zero and a saturation and value of one. And the second flag to a hue and saturation of one. And now we're going to have a color ramp that is going across the entire color spectrum. For our strength, as we saw in the demo video, we wanted different colors to have different strengths and for those to be able to change dynamically based on our audio. Well, we've already got our noise attribute 
So what I can do is say that when that noise is equal to a certain value, we can use that as a switch to change the strength of our emission. So if I plug these into my switch, we'll say that true, we'll say two, and a false of 0 0.1. We may need to change these later as we start playing these uh, live for audio. And now our epsilon becomes the range of our color ramp that we're gonna see. So as I scroll this up, you know, we're gonna see a lot more of it. So if I set it to point 0.1, we're getting that kind of just that yellow and red area at the back. As I scroll this up, we're now going to be able to change the illuminated color of our visualizer. And this is a value that we will plug in to our audio buffer shortly to be able to uh, control that based on the drum beat. Let's frame these up. And we'll call these materials. So now we've got our buffer, well, we've got our visualizer set up. We actually now need to start bringing in our audio and dealing with the audio reactivity part. So the first thing that I need to do is to bring my audio actually into Blender. So I'm gonna change this to the video sequencer, shift A and add sound. And if I go to my audio tracks folder, this is the folder that was downloadable um, earlier. And in it, you'll see we have four different um, audio files. Uh, we have the drums, the lead guitar, and the riff that are all separated from each other. And then we have the mix master, which is the main master track of our audio. So this is the audio that we can load in to our video sequencer. So we'll add the sound strip. And it's obviously far too big for our timeline. So let's check under our time source here, we can see that it's ending at 881. So let's change our frames. And let's, I'm just gonna lower this volume because I don't know how loud this is gonna be. Far too loud, my apologies. 0 0.1. That's still too loud. There we go. So we've now got our audio loaded into our video sequencer. Um, the next thing that's really important any time that you are dealing with audio in Blender is to change your playback from play every frame to sync to audio uh, because otherwise what you're going to see in the viewport is not going to be the same or it's not going to be the same as when you render because it's going to try and play every single frame. So you need to make sure that you set this to sync to audio. Next, we want to start bringing in those other three audio files that we can deal with for our seed values. So I'm going to go to my graph editor and I'm going to add a value node. We'll rename this node as riff, making sure that my playhead is at uh, the first frame. I'm just going to press I to keyframe this. And I can then bring this, uh, I can use our audio files to control this value. If we go channel, sounds to samples, and I need to find my audio tracks. And we've got a bunch of options here. Um, you've got like a frequency range, which basically gives you a, well, it's exactly a, a range of frequencies that will isolate the different uh, parts of the audio. Um, so, for instance, if you just wanted the, the base of um, an audio, you could set this between 250 and 2,000. If you wanted the trebles, you could do 6 to 8,000, uh, etc. I'm sure if you just Google, you know, the different frequency ranges for different parts, you can find uh, that information quite easily online. Uh, in this case, we're just going to leave these as the, as the defaults. Uh, for the moment, although we will change these later on for the drums. We're going to select our riff, sounds to samples, and we now have a kind of an F curve inside of our graph editor that is representative of the volume, basically, of our audio file. 
We could, if we wanted to, uh, go samples to keys and actually turn these into actual keyframe data that we could manipulate in other ways. We could change them, move them around, add modifiers to them. I'm gonna undo that. I'm just gonna leave them as the default samples for the moment. And you can see as I start scrolling through my timeline, that riff value here is now changing. However, I don't um, just want to plug this directly into the W value because otherwise it's just going to kind of oscillate back and forth like this and give this kind of weird, like, jaggedy jumping motion, which is not what I want. I want these to accumulate over time. Um, before anybody might uh, ask at some point later, on the sounds to samples, there is an accumulate option here. Um, however, I found that this produces kind of a bit more um, like jaggedy results. It doesn't necessarily uh, like smooth that curve out. And so what I'm gonna do instead is actually build my own accumulated um, node for my sound buffer using simulation nodes. So that's where our audio buffer is gonna come in. So off of our riff, I'm gonna add a reroute node. Control G to put it into its own node group. Get rid of that. And let's rename our inputs. Our first input is going to be our audio. And our output for the first one is going to be accumulated. Let's add a simulation zone. And for anybody who's unsure or unaware of exactly what simulation zones do, um, they basically allow you to track data over time. That's the simplest explanation of it. Um, and obviously you can use that to create very complex physics simulations or, you know, crazy kind of traffic simulations. Um, all we're going to be doing is using it to track our audio data. Uh, we're just creating a data buffer, basically. To do this, we're going to need something to store our data on. So I'm going to add a point. And I'm just going to add a single point. Um, I'm not using this point to uh, like instance or render in any way. I'm just using it as a container for our data. Um, I'm also going to need to split my window here and get the spreadsheets as well. <clears throat> Make a bit more room here. Uh, to get the audio, in, to get the information out of our points, out of our data container, and then into something that we can use in our main setup, um, what we're going to do is just sample the index. We can leave the index at zero because there's only one point, so it's an index of zero anyway. And what we're going to sample is a named attribute. We're going to call this accumulated and then hook it up to our output. Now, obviously, we don't have an accumulated attribute yet, so we need to store one. So, store named attribute. Apologies if I'm going a bit too fast for everybody, by the way, that's following along. I'm just trying to make sure that we get through it on time. Um, I'm going to copy and paste the name into my attribute. And all I need to do is to take my audio and add the accumulated attribute to it on every frame. So that on the first frame, we're, we don't have anything um, that's, like the accumulated attribute is at zero because it doesn't exist. So it's just gonna store the audio. On the second frame, it's gonna store, it's gonna update with the audio from the previous frame and the audio from the second frame and so on and so forth. So now, we have an accumulated uh, output, and I'm gonna run this through a multiply node so that we've got like a scalar value uh, so we can control the strength. And I'm gonna set this to say 0.2. And now if I plug this into my W for my audio, as I play this through, the noise is going to change over time and as you may have noticed at the start, when that riff slowed down and there was a noticeable break in the audio, the visualizer stops moving. There. 
uh, because there's no more frames that are being, or there's no more data that's being added to our accumulated attributes on those frames because the audio has dropped. <clears throat> Next, we can do exactly the same thing for our lead guitar. So let's duplicate all of these nodes. We'll rename our riff to be lead. Set this back to zero and making sure that I'm on the first frame, I to keyframe. And we're going to do exactly the same thing. Channels, sounds to samples, and we'll bring our lead guitar. Um, we, again, we can leave the, all the settings as default for the moment. That's not a problem. And now we have an audio wave here that there's nothing at the start because the lead guitar doesn't kick in on this until later on around that 250 frame. Hook this into our W. And again, let's, what I'm actually going to do is disconnect it, the W here on our riff, just so we can see what the lead guitar is doing. So our lead guitar is now controlling the noise of this. So now we have our lead guitar set up. Next, we want our drums. So again, we can duplicate all of these nodes. Rename this to drum. I to add a keyframe. Channels, we need to make sure that the uh, node is actually selected. Sounds to samples. We'll select our drums, and on this one, I actually do want to change the frequency range because what I would like is the, the pulsing motion that we want to add on every drum beat. I want that to be stronger for the cymbals. So when the cymbals are hitting, it's pulsing uh, in a bigger way than just the kick drum. So I'm going to change that from 0 to 100,000 to, I think, 5,000 to 10,000. Um, these are in kilohertz. Sounds samples, and you can see we've got our audio here. It's obviously very, um, like the, the size and the, the values is quite small because we've isolated those frame ranges. Um, if I was to redo that and just set those back to the defaults, so zero to whatever the default was, 100,000. The audio for the drums now on the default values is obviously a lot stronger, but that's not what we want on this specific occasion. So set that back to 5,000 to 10,000. And you'll see now that we've got these different spikes for our kick drum. And then as we look over here, these are going to be our cymbal crashes. So our cymbals are going to be a lot stronger than our kick drum, which is exactly what we want. I'm going to need to multiply this up quite a lot, uh, potentially by 10. Plug this into the W. And for remember, we said that we need to change the negative of our scale here. So I actually don't need to use my audio buffer for that. I can just take another multiply node hook the drums straight into it, and we can do it by negative 10, because we need to make sure we're going in the negative direction. Hook this up to the scale of our noise drum. So now, as we, again, if I disconnect the, um, the guitars, so we're not gonna see any of the distortion, we're just looking at what the drum is doing. So that's becoming a lot stronger compared to uh, just the where it's pulsing on the kick drum. So now if we hook all these back up together, add these back into the W, go to the start and we can see what this looks like in total. So yeah, 
It's looking pretty decent. Oh, thank you. So next, we want to, there's going to be a bit of kind of data wrangling in this next bit. Um, so if I lose anybody with some of the math, if I haven't lost half of you already, um, I apologize. And please feel free to, to ask later on uh, any questions that you might have. Uh, so what we now want is that, uh, N, that B value where we're equal to our noise, where we're choosing the selection of our color. I want that to be dependent on the drum beat. So I'm going to get, I'm going to reduplicate that. And this one I am going to use just the default drum values. So we can keyframe it, channel, sounds to samples, take our drums, we'll reset these to our defaults. So we've got these big spikes, which is every drum and cymbal beat. And what I would like is that after every drum beat, we randomize the color that is selected. So how do we do that? We're going to use our node group, which I should really name. We'll call this audio buffer. Let's duplicate our audio buffer. We'll add our drum beat into this. And we're going to use uh, this simulation zone to be able to track when our data is at a certain value. In my graph, I'm going to untick uh, the only show selected so I can see all of my audio files here. Um, and also the one thing that actually, just as a small gripe, uh, while I've got a platform for it, I'm, it really annoys me that you can't rename these default va like the names of like the default value in the graph editor. If anybody knows how to do that, or if there's any devs watching that know would, or would like to try and fix that, please, that would be great. Um, I'm going to turn those off though for these ones. So we just want to isolate our drum beats. I'm also going to just add a reroute node here and view our, in fact, I won't do that just yet. What I want to do is to control that B value from inside of my audio buffer. So just like we did with the accumulated output, I'm going to sample another one. Duplicate the wrong things there. Named attribute and sample index. And I'm going to call this selection. We'll hook this one up to our outputs. And we'll rename it. And we can hook our selection up to that B value. So obviously we don't yet have a selection attribute. So let's create one. Store named attribute. Call it selection. So now as I change this value, we're changing the color selection. And I'm going to use a random value just between 0 and 1. We can hook this up. And now we have a seed that as we change our seed value, we're changing the different color selection. Just like we've already been doing with named attributes, we're going to use another one. And we're going to call this seed. And we'll hook this up to our seed. And I think this needs to be an integer. And again, we can now store the named attributes Make this an integer seed. So now when we change this seed here, our colors are changing. <clears throat> so how can we change our seed value based on our audio? Well, what I'm going to do is, again, we're going to need two more attributes. I'm going to call this one um, F for frame, that's fine. And it's going to be a Boolean value. So what we can say is that with our audio, when our audio is equal to a certain value, it's either going to be true or false. And that value and the epsilon is going to be a value based on our wave, on our audio here. So I'm thinking when it gets to like this zero, 
when it hits the bottom of these spikes, that's when I want my seed to change. We also need to make sure that we add a bit of a epsilon because it doesn't quite reach zero on these symbol values where these, this is where the symbols are hitting and it's not quite reaching zero. So if we say zero with an epsilon of 0 0.1 and hook this up to our value. Now what I'm gonna do is just view our point. So just need to keep an eye on the, uh, the spreadsheet. You're not gonna see anything in the, uh, the viewport for the moment, but now, so our F, attribute is true because the value is at zero and as I scroll up with true false true false true etc so we've now got a boolean value that we can use as a switch there is one problem though this value this boolean value of f is currently true for one, two, three, four, five, six, like six frames. If we were to use that to change the seed, it's gonna mean that the color is gonna change six times in six frames. And I don't want to give anybody an epileptic fit. So instead, what we can do is we're gonna add one last attribute. Again, it's gonna be a Boolean value and it's gonna be F minus one. And the value is just going to be F. So every time, delete that, select the correct one. There we go. So now when I go back to the start, F is true and F minus one is false. On the second frame, F is false, but F minus one is now true because this is now the value of what F was on the previous frame. So by doing this, we're able to now track when our, date, when our value changes the first time. So we can say that when F is true, so as we go up, they're both false now, but now we've just hit that point where we want our color to change. F is true and F minus one is false. So we can just do a little bit of Boolean math, take both of our attributes, so when f is equal to one or true and f minus one is equal to zero, so it's false, and we're going to add a Boolean math node and say that when both of these are true, this is now giving me a switch. Change it to an integer. This is now a switch that I can use to add to my seed. So when it's false, it's going to be zero. When it's true, it's going to be one. So we're going to add one to our seed. Make a little bit more room. We can add these to our seed attribute, just like we did with the accumulated, and add this together. So now, as I go back to the start, we have a seed of one and a selection of 0 0.295. As I go up, our seed has now changed as has our selection value. When we hit the next one, our seed changes again. Keep going, so on and so forth. So now, if I get rid of my viewer node, this should, in theory, means that our color is also changing. <clears throat> and that's pretty much it. I mean, the, the thing here is this is a relatively simple example. Um, to be honest, it's only a couple of different noise textures. Um, you know, you could make these as complex as you wanted. You could add more noise textures. You could do lots of different things with it. Um, I've got a couple of different examples here of, I don't save that because I don't need to, it'll be fine. Demo plane is this one. So I've got another example. Ooh, that was way too loud. So I've got a similar thing here where instead of it being on a, 
um, just distributing a load of points. Instead, it's on like a kind of a grid that's distributing up and down. And it's exactly the same concept. And it's a lot of these things that we use for the Jacob Collier project, where we used, we separated that head into different colored collections. Um, and we were able to use the exact same uh, kind of techniques to be able to, to do the Jacob Collier stuff. Um, just looking at the time, looks like I'm doing pretty good. Uh, so yeah, that's it for me. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yep. Is it possible to do it with live audio? Pardon, I'm sorry? Uh, is it possible to do it with live audio as well with Blender? Like um, to... I'm, the answer to that is I'm not sure, to be perfectly honest. I'm sure it probably is, but you'd need to get some way of bringing the audio directly in to Blender. And I'm, not, I'm not sure how you do that. Um, but I mean, all of this is based on kind of a key on keyframes, basically, uh, on a value that's being tracked from an, uh, like a sound wave. So if you're able to get that into Blender, then yes. But I don't know how to do that. Yeah, exactly. It would need to be sampled live. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Great. Thank you.